this is a quiet podcast. I said, shh. I don't want to. Shh. Okay. I'm Matisse Van Rossum, and I'm safe and sound. The quiet place? Oh. What is this, a freaking library? <laughs> it's Ben Sheets. Hello, I'm Cleveland Mosier, and I'm the last to bust. Oh! Because, <laughs> you know, like Last of Us, which this movie's a lot like, you know, the game. But <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. You get it. You get it. <laughs> Think but about combined it. Combined with your sexual prowess, you're the last to bust. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's not a race. <laughs> 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 well, we're uh, super excited to be joined by uh, returning guests, Joe Shea, all the way from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Joe, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's uh, it's good to be back. We're glad to have you. Uh, Listeners may recognize Joe from, uh, most recently, our episode on The Guest, but anyone who's been with us for a long time... The old heads. The the, the real ones. The real ones will remember that Joe was one of our first guests on the podcast and came on to talk about the first Quiet Place film. Uh, And this evening, we are, of course, going to be talking about A Quiet Place part two written and directed by cia office jim and uh starring emily blunt millicent simmons cillian murphy noah jupe and of course cia office jim himself john krasinski yes and i i want to start this off by saying spoiler warning for the first uh, uh yeah i don't think we can talk about nope. this movie at all yeah. without not feasible spoiling the first one um, so just watch that one and come back if you haven't seen that one maybe even listen to our first episode yeah i would recommend mm. it. yeah, yeah. I, um, I can't necessarily recommend it because i'm not on that episode but you yeah, know well you should maybe you should watch it who's to say well, just uh, think about Cleveland while you're listening to the podcast, you and that will remedy it. Print out a picture of my face, put some candles beneath it, and you know, just listen away, and it, it's it'll be you just, just like I'm there. Him there, yeah, he's yeah. there in spirit. Uh, well, we rewatched the first one in preparation for this one, and uh, it was Cleveland's first time seeing it as well. Twas. I will say off the bat, I had cooled down slightly on the first Quiet Place. I wasn't as wild about it as I was when I first saw it, but went into this second one pretty excited and largely had my expectations rewarded. Um, just in general, I, I thought that this one was probably as good as the first one, if maybe not even just a tiny little bit better, but, uh, not a step down in my opinion. Yeah. I was really positive on it overall. I think the first one's such a no nonsense thriller and this one is very much the same. You get a lot of great and clever set pieces and uses of both the monsters as well as kind of the the central gimmick. But this one also had some good character stuff with Cillian Murphy. Yes. Yeah, which was really good. And yeah, I'm pretty positive on it overall. What do you think, Cleve? Uh, actually, uh, Joe, how about you go first? Because okay. uh, my, my opinion carries in through the first one. And I think okay. it'll be nice for to, to kind of talk about sure, my take sure, on the first. Sure. I follow this rule that I don't watch movie trailers. So I actually had no idea if it was a prequel or a sequel. Like, I literally had no idea what part two was going to be because I think that I heard that John Krasinski was starring in it, and I was like, spoilers, he's dead. So I was like, (laughs) how are they doing that? I really liked starting it off day one. I think I'm a sucker for day one moments. I think my expectations were exceeded as well. And I, I think I'm with you, Matisse. Like, I'm... I think it's like uh, might be a tiny bit better, if not like just as good. I had a good time. Yeah, I'm I'm with you, man. Like I like day one moments in sequels specifically. Uh, one of my mm. favorite things about the first Quiet Place was that we did not get an explanation for the invasion. Uh, that it, you know, at the beginning we saw day 89 when like the little boy is taken and then it jumps forward to day 450 something or, or you know, such and such. And the fact that we didn't see how the world got into this state 
uh, I thought was one of the strengths of the first film. But for this one, I thought seeing day one of the invasion was kind of a nice little prologue. I it liked feels it. earned mm -hmm. uh, by then. You know, like, we stuck around, we got to know the family, and so getting to see them pre-invasion was, was gratifying. So also, they did it without explaining too much about the invaders. Yeah, and, and largely those sequences serviced the rest of the film. There was mm -hmm. a little fat on the invasion sequences. Like, they, they helped, like, build character moments that would come into play later, and uh, I, I liked that a we lot. Know, we know they're extraterrestrial, and we know that they came in on meteors that fell from the sky, and not spaceships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's about it. Um, and I Man. think that that's just the right amount. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the cynical part of me wants to say, Office Jim, after killing himself off, just had to write himself back into the movie. <laughs> I was reading that apparently he didn't want to be so heavily involved in this movie and the producers quote unquote tricked him into it i don't know how true that is i don't know how you get tricked into writing directing and starring in a film <laughs> but uh, i am glad there was a little restraint there though yes, like yes. i feel like it would be a little indulgent if it was just full-on prequel I, thought, I think they could do that well. I I don't know. I thought it was, there nice. was just enough. Of I it. thought it was nice to see him a little bit at the beginning, uh, and then that the lack of his presence in the rest of the film uh, left space for Cillian Murphy, who I not only think is a much better actor but uh, a more interesting character in this movie too. Mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoyed the addition of him. I like Krasinski as an actor. None of the problems that I have with, like, any of his prior roles that I've seen have to do with, like, his performances. Even, and this is the last and only thing I'm going to say about it, but, like, even on The Office, like, I think, I think, like, his, his character, like, in the way he portrays his character is, like, is just fine. Even well done. As for, like, the show and everything else affiliated with it, whatever. But I largely agree with all of that. It was interesting because I got to see them, like, back to back, both for the first time. Uh, I had managed to avoid quiet place like spoilers for years um i knew you had to be quiet and that it was apocalyptic uh but that, that was about and it. there was a place yeah <laughs> uh, yes yeah there was a, a quiet place uh that was that was part of it it was cool like uh you know getting to see it all for the first time and yeah i would agree that this sequel elevated the good things but I will, I will also note that I had some minor qualms with the, some plot holes in the first yes. movie. And I think that they kind of doubled down on some of those plot holes in the second. There are a couple uh, of that are worse. I would could say I would say incredibly glaring plot holes but in the second one. The production yeah. value and the character story uh, is is so well done and uh, like has such a continuous drive that like in the moment I was happy to look past any of them for me they were impossible to miss like just these like giant glaring holes but i was so happy with where i was that i didn't you know i didn't really give a shit like the set pieces themselves were largely so effective which i think is what the first one did really well too mm -hmm. there are a lot of like really tense like kind of classic horror movie set pieces that are executed so well that like the, the the holes that you could poke in the logic of these movies are more forgivable because it's so entertaining. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a big aspect of it. Like I think both of these movies are very entertaining films. And for like an alien invasion monster movie, like that's what I want first and foremost before anything else is I want entertainment. And what I'll say about those plot holes too is while they're glaring, they don't get in the way of the character drama aspect which is the most important part mm -hmm. like, and they don't get in the way of the fun set pieces either yeah it's like true. they do get in the way of like the world building and the monstery yes, stuff yes yes but, exactly yes. but that's okay because again like that's not what we're really there for we're there for like the the odyssey that these characters are on no one really gives a shit like how the cyclops is able to like see depth of field in the odyssey like no one gives a shit <laughs> you know what i mean there are just certain factors that that don't really need to matter as much i'd probably give like the first last of us um like a like a 3.5 or a 4 you know since i wasn't there to rate it i figured i'd just the say first, that now. The, first quiet quiet place. Place. the first oh did i say last of us yeah. there's gonna be a lot of that and while visually these films are damn near identical to the the games the last of us and the quiet place are wildly similar 
um, they are trying to do very different things. Um, this movie isn't necessarily trying to embrace Cormac McCarthy the same way that The Last of Us is. The world building is a lot more important to The Last of Us as well because it's it's all about like how tangible it is. Like you can really like walk around and feel like you can touch everything. But even down to the monsters, you know, the the clickers in The Last of Us, you know, like the the final evolution of the the zombie virus are these zombie like alien creatures that have become so like overgrown with fungal growth that their their faces are just like blooms of like mushroom fungal goodness, and um, they click, they echolocate. So you're going through these sewer sequences and, like, you have to watch your quiet meter, you know, and, like, not make sounds. Otherwise, the clickers will hear you and they'll, they'll you know, hunt you down. And that's this movie. But I don't mind that because I love The Last of Us and it was really nice to see that, like, on the big screen. So in no way is that a complaint from me. It's gratifying, even. And there's plenty of room. Uh, the Last of Us didn't invent post-apocalyptic narratives. Like I said, like, it's largely um, influenced by Cormac McCarthy's The Road and, you know, like so many other narratives that came before. Like it's a it's a well a well set genre. Yeah, well, one thing I really loved about kind of the progression of the first to the second here is it takes that really cathartic moment at the end of the first one, you know, with the hearing aid and uh, the microphone mm. and the shotgun, especially and kind of pushes that to kind of be the central hub of this one and you get a lot more of those cathartic moments because of it and i thought that was really well done in this actually it like was. yeah it was super rewarding um one of my favorite sequences in this new one is for example the train sequence yeah where uh millicent simmons uh is on her own trying to find the location of this uh this radio frequency mm -hmm. and she goes onto a train and accidentally alerts an alien. Um, and it's, it's just taking that same kind of tension that's introduced in the first movie throughout and kind of giving some additional agency in, in so far as they know how they can conquer these aliens. Right. But there's some added challenges in that process. The aliens are no longer completely invulnerable. Like, I I like that there's kind of a progression. I'll bring it back up again when we get to, like, the end of this film. But we know there's going to be A Quiet Place Part 3. And sort of the way the films progress is, like, by the end of each one, they feel like they have a little bit more of a chance. Not a whole lot, but just a little bit. The first one ends with them using the combination of the feedback from her hearing aid with the, the microphone and the amp to stun the creatures so you can shoot them in their big fleshy heads. Uh, and then it's like, okay, we have this. We can now leave the farm and try to get somewhere safe. And, like, alerting the creatures isn't guaranteed death any longer. Uh, it's only slightly less guaranteed death. One thing I did really like about this movie, big to this film's credit, is that that weapon doesn't feel overpowered. Like, the monsters still feel like very much of a threat and still better avoided than mm -hmm. just... Just, uh, yeah, well, I think sword. the train sequence is a great yeah. example of that because, you know, Millicent Simmons uses her hearing aid uh, to try to fend it off, but she struggles with the shotgun. Yeah. And so the alien is still coming towards her and still very much a threat, right. even though it might have been slowed down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of tension that can be built out of and that. And it's like, it's, it's it's like, you, can like... Get, you can get one of them, but the gunshot is going to draw a lot more of them. The strategy of the feedback is not really designed for trying to take on more than one of them at a time. Mm -hmm. So we never uh, really, we never see it used on multiple at a time, do we? No. Yeah, there's never really a sequence. Um, which is cool. My comparison would be it's like the hero now has a magic sword, but they have to learn how to use it. Right. And that's cool. That's a uh, you know like classic. So while we're talking about how to defeat these creatures, let's talk about these creatures. Let's go ahead and get into the plot hole issue that I sort of have with the first movie, which is how these creatures operate. Uh, so we can get it out of the way, honestly, because I, I want to talk about the good stuff too. The crux of the film, as we all know, is that these creatures are apex predators. They have super long, sharp claws and teeth and long limbs 
and they are way fast. And they are heavily armored too. Yeah, like gunshots do not affect them. Mm-hmm. They have like a hide, like a, like steel, and uh, they they move yeah like unbelievably fast. And their their head is like all mouth and uh and then ear. All and, mouth and ear. <laughs> yeah. So they uh, yeah there's like this cool like large cochlea you know kind of like alien ear that they have like it's really neat like when it when it's exposed. So they have big old ears. And you hear them like shriek, but they don't echolocate. This is the big one for me. And I and I asked it like in the middle of watching the first movie. Like I I, I just kind of said, you know, partway through, do they echolocate or not? Because like they don't like project out sound. They're not like bats. They can't just like create like a, an an uh, aural map like of their surroundings. Because then like they might as well be able to see at that point. Right. Right. So they can just hear really really well. Okay. Cool. How can they run through the woods, which we see them do regularly? Well, that's that's the thing, is right? Like they couldn't; they just they, run into trees <laughs> all the time. Well, the, well the, they do run into shit constantly, which I think is really funny because you're absolutely right. Like it's an extremely inefficient way to hunt when your hunting is based entirely on sound by just careening blindly into things and making as much noise as possible, banging into shit, shrieking. <laughs> Whereas, like, you look at something like bats or dolphins, which echolocate, although dolphins can also see, it's precision hunting, right? It's like you you project out sound, build an aural map, locate the prey, and then strike it with precision. Yeah. That's not how these things operate at all. They hear a noise, and they just go charging in, banging into yeah. things. And, like, echolocation is fascinating, too, because, like, you're able to see, like, omnidirectionally, right? Again, like, you have, like, a full take of your surroundings from any direction like anything that bounced off of something like you understand its location you know here like not the case and i I do i do think it's funny that these things are like absolutely horrifying but like their ears which are such like a a cool like visual component of them like are worse than like a flying mouse (laughs) you know like like so much for apex predator like uh but it's a small, it, it is a small thing, and I'm happy to put it behind me again because the creature design is so good. They're and, scary. Like, they're still scary and, creatures, and for sure. If if you do choose, like, whether they echolocate or not, either way, you have to completely change, like, the film's, like, core premise. So, I get it. Like, that's all right. They're aliens. They use alien hearing, you know? Like, whatever. Um, Maybe that's why they're so heavily armored, because they bang into stuff all the time. They just run into things. They just evolved a thicker hide. Right, they're like a train. It's like running into stuff doesn't matter if you can just run through it, you know? (laughs) And I, and that is very much the approach they take. Mm-hmm. We see a lot of that, like, when they're chasing them into, like, the abandoned steel factory. It, like, when they're running through, like, that big room with all the machinery, and it's just, like, barreling through things. Yeah. But also, like, that's loud. If you're hunting, like, if you're hunting by sound, you'd think that that would not be a super effective way to locate your prey is by making as much noise as possible. <laughs> no. Do you uh, think they end up chasing after each other just because one makes noise? Damn, that's a good question. Something. That's a good question. Right, because the... then you have to say, like, oh, well, no, they can smell each other. But, oh, wait, they can smell? Because <laughs> then... The non-stinky it's... place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love the non-stinkless place. Learn... Yeah. What'd you say, Joe? <laughs> I wonder if we're going to learn more about the aliens and themselves, because it almost seems like we kind of got a little bit more. I mean, we did like you find out that they came in from meteors. Uh, I wonder if in the third one that they'll kind of dive into more of the aliens of themselves, because I think that's kind of the fun thing about with aliens is like, do they communicate like telekinetic to each other? Something that I talked about with a friend of mine who I saw Quiet Place Part 2 with was as like maybe another race sent these creatures onto Earth just to like wreak havoc and fuck Mm. shit up. And like they're not like fully evolved creatures. 
they don't seem sentient. Well, it's it's, it's like not... the alien, right? They're a bio weapon, like yeah. which makes a lot of sense to me. I I love that. Thing. Yeah, because like, they come in on a meteor, right? Right, exactly. So, so... A meteor, right? Uh, but uh, so you they're can not think, like, capable yeah. of inter of like true interstellar travel. Yeah, we we don't know how how far they came in from, but you right. can also like fire a big rock out of a cannon. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah, but like also, can, like, uh, they don't they don't use technology. They don't. We don't see them using tools. Like, mm-hmm. they're very animalistic. Yeah, the aliens um, themselves, and it'd be cool. Like, I could, which I could is cool because, see... like, most alien invasion movies, it's like the aliens have to get to Earth somehow, so they come in in ships. You know, so they're like hyper intelligent and have like weapons and stuff. Like, it's cool to see a take on that where someone or something or just happenstance fired a big rock at Earth that had, like, some nasty space fleas on it, yeah. you know? Well, it's essentially the alien. It's just a new take on it, like, in that sense, you know? Like, sure. The alien is, like, the ultimate bioweapon. Like, there's nothing technological about it. That's what's terror. That's one of the things that Which is why terrifying. I kind of... It would be cliche, and this may be getting a bit ahead of ourselves, but I, I kind of hope in A Quiet Place Part 3, there's a, a plot that revolves around, like, there's a, an alien queen, and they have to kill... Dude, they're, like, no, a, I want they're, it. like, I want a hive... Next. They're, like, a hive mind, and mm-hmm. they have to... They have to to kill the the alien queen and it will it'll kill all of the the others and save the world or whatever look i'm ready for that kind of dumb shit no honestly though and like it can be done well like look at like i am legend like some of the best moments are when like he goes like deep underground and like he sees like the whole hive of them right yeah i agree i, I want to see like that i didn't want to see it in either of these movies i don't, I don't think it's needed but no. uh it, it could be really cool or even better to see, like, if they were placed here by design, which either way is cool. I like the idea of it just being total happenstance. They happen to just be, like, wretched space life on a meteor that happened to crash on Earth. Just the worst circumstance could, that could happen did. But I also like the idea of something firing them at Earth. Um, like, them, like, it was a, a planned bombardment, uh, which is cool because, like, it still would have been done organically. Mm-hmm. And seeing, like, what fired them at Earth, like, uh, like you were saying, Joe, like, like, as if these creatures are, like, clearing the way for something else, something greater. Whether it's just, like, a queen or, like, we see, like, the high society version of these creatures. <laughs> the ones that can use tools. Yeah. Yeah. Or just a totally different race that has, like, subjugated these creatures and it uses them as, like, attack dogs. Mm-hmm. Like, fire them onto a planet, wipe out the local population, and then come in and take up residence. Mm-hmm. One piece of world building I thought was done well and sort of patched from the first film is they make it clear that, like, it's not just any hearing aid, um, which is the impression I was sort of under. At the end of the first movie, I was just thinking, like, so no one, like, tried feedback on these hearing creatures, you know? Like, the U.S. government, like, didn't have a chance to, like, try the most obvious solution. Now we can assume that they did. They they likely did. It just happens to be, like, that specific frequency from that device, also, like, that's the vibe that I got. Like, it, it's just total happenstance. Also, like, I think... To like, that degree, and the, that impl- works. the implication that I've always gotten to is that the invasion was too sudden and too ferocious for them to really, like, experiment with different kinds of weaponry. Because in the first one, like, we see them on day 89, not even three months in. And it's already post-apocalyptic. They're the last ones there, you know, like, everybody's dead. Like, that's really fast. So I I like to think that the invasion happened so quickly that the government didn't have time to, like, experiment with, like, sonic weaponry because it's just, like, they just swarmed and killed fucking everybody within a couple of months. Which has me thinking, too, that, like, they must have come in on multiple meteors, which makes, like, it, an, yeah, for it sure. being an orbital bombardment way more likely. Or big meteor that broke up into multiple me- meteors on entering Earth's atmosphere. Well, because at the beginning of this one, like, when he, when John Krasinski goes into the general store, the owner is watching TV about, like, something that happened in Shanghai, and we see, like, all the fires and stuff. Right, across the planet. So, like, one meteor breaking up in the atmosphere and getting across the planet doesn't doesn't sure track. Sure it does. Gravity mm. pulls things around the planet. Not once you've entered Atmo. Depends like, on when it breaks the, up in high Atmo. It can go... 
Yeah, n- yeah. No, 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 no. Mr. Meteor expert over here. Okay, when satellites crash into each other, do they like, you know, satellites like create like tiny. meteor bombardments on tiny. Earth? Like, We're talking a big ass space rock here. Yeah, right, but we, if see, it's that how, big, it we see how break, big right? the, the fragment is. It well, could. It doesn't track for me. I don't, what if I don't it was made it. of mica? <laughs> yeah, we don't know. I think yeah. that's the fun thing about it is that we don't really know what happened. Yes. I agree. Yeah, 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 thank God they don't get into this stuff, uh, honestly, and maybe maybe we shouldn't uh, <laughs> either <laughs> at that. That's fair. Well, let's talk about the main premise of this movie, right? Yeah. They start literally right after the first ends. Yep. Or at least they, after we see the day one prologue or whatever. Yeah, they see uh, a flare or, you know, some sort of light. A signal fire. Yeah, a yeah. signal from nearby. So they go to investigate. From there, it kind of goes wild, uh, but it does turn out to be one of John Krasinski's friends. Yeah, well, just like a family friend yeah. from the town, uh, Cillian Murphy. We see him and you know with them in day one at the the little league baseball game. Like he knows them, they know him. They both have kids around the same age. Presumably, their kids are probably friends. So Emily Blunt and the kids find Cillian Murphy, uh, who's been hiding out in the uh, the abandoned steel mill, and they, uh, while playing with the radio, find someone is broadcasting, someone is transmitting the song Somewhere Beyond Somewhere the Sea. Beyond the Sea, somewhere so, waiting for me. So Millicent Simmons, uh, the daughter, who uh, I I love that she has even more of like a focal role in this movie. She's great. She is the one to figure out that it is a a signal. It is a uh, a clue, a hint. She looks at a map and sees an island uh, just off the coast, not particularly far away, and determines, uh, hey, there's people living there they're broad that's where they're broadcasting from they're telling us to look beyond the sea so and they she, can find rapture yeah and, right you know, uh, meet andrew ryan andrew ryan and, yeah, go yeah, down the bathosphere right. and uh yeah see that is the funny thing is like she figured out it's like oh yeah they must be coming from the island like if i heard that signal it's like somewhere beyond the sea oh so we gotta go to europe <laughs> <laughs> we're like oh i guess like someone's a bioshock fan <laughs> it's like it's, it's like, like yeah we gotta the... find we gotta find a sailboat and sail across the Atlantic Ocean and just sail right past that island where yeah. the people are. <laughs> we gotta. Isn't get it to... on like an FM broadcast? Yeah, I mean, but that's of course assuming that people are smart, <laughs> unlike me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you would you would think that it's like okay, it's got it can't be somewhere as far away as Europe, but I'd be like beyond the sea, that's Europe or Africa. <laughs> But so Millicent Simmons is like, okay, well, if they're broadcasting, that means if I can get to them, I can use my hearing aid to broadcast like the feedback frequency. So it would essentially turn any radio into uh, into a weapon against the creatures. So she she kind of sets out on her own. Not even kind of, yeah. She straight up just yeah. Leaves. She she sets out on her own because she knows that her mom would not let her go, or they would not want to go, because of course they have the baby, which makes for a great against all odds story. Like the more I've thought about it, the the more I like that. Um, yeah. Because I was a little uncertain about it, like beforehand. I was like, ah, survivalistic. That's not great. But like y'all's y'all's point was really bad. Like she's young. She's a kid. Like. You know, she's not she's not considering that. She's considering, like, how important it is. And uh, it's very brave of her character as well. And and she wants... She has a lot of guilt from, like, the first movie because she feels guilty for her little brother getting taken at the beginning. You know, like, that's... As well as her father's death, I'm sure. And then feels guilty for her father's death after that. So she has a lot of guilt and obviously wants their deaths to not mean nothing. So it sets up a great, like, against all odds scenario yeah. where, like, she is deaf. And it makes, and yeah. And these creatures have supersonic hearing and she can't even hear herself. Right. Like, so, uh, it is, uh, yeah, really like a, a feat. And it's portrayed really well. They set it up great in the opener 
where we get a few sequences like from her perspective where like the sound is cut out uh, so we kind of like see the world through her ears um <laughs> and uh you know we we carry back to that during those sequences like on the train they do and that they, yeah, multiple it's, it's times fantastic. i love that where they'll cut out the sound completely so it's dead silent and then they bring the sound back in every time they do it when somebody touches her so it's almost like it's like transferring mm-hmm. from her perspective to that other character, which is so true. Via touch, like, which contact is, a, is yeah. so important because um, they so do important. it. Th- they do it at the beginning with John Krasinski on day one, and then later, like after the train sequence, uh, where she thinks that Cillian Murphy has like taken the the hearing aid and like abandoned her, and we get that part where it cuts out the sound and she's like crying on the ground, and then he comes up and like puts a hand on her, and then the sound bleeds back in. Mm-hmm. Um, which is super really cool, like, like um, yeah. you know, like I have a deaf dog, and uh, you know, like it's it's always really like, super important for her to uh, like be keeping contact. You know, like um, she really likes to stay close, and uh, you know, because she can't, she's she's a shepherd. You know, it's so, like she's a herding dog. Um, so like knowing where things are is like bred into her. Like that's really important. So she compensates by like always keeping contact. So like really often, like while I'm painting or working, like she's like up against my leg facing the other direction. So she feels like, you know, we're covering all angles and, uh, you know, like she always knows where I am. Like, even if she's looking the other way, like she can feel me against her. So like contact is like super important. So, uh, yeah, I I liked, I like seeing that. I like, I, uh, and feeling that in the film, um, it, it felt genuine to me. Yeah. And it makes sense too, that like, it has to be her as well, because like Emily Blunt, you know, she's just lost her husband and she has three children that she's responsible for, one of whom is like a two day old infant. I like, love the oxygen canister. Like Yeah, the the quiet box yeah, <laughs> for, for the baby. Yeah. Uh no, it's it's very clever and also like becomes a a, a Chekhov's gun uh sort of later in the film, which is great. But, like, yeah, so she's she's not trying to be heroic. The little boy, the brother, is a total coward. I'm not saying that, like, as a criticism. Like, he's a, he's a child, uh, and he's in a scary situation. But they establish that really nicely at the beginning in the prologue where, like, he's, he's playing in the Little League game, and he keeps, like, flinching away from the, the ball when it's thrown. So, like, it's set up that he's, like... He's he's sort of a timid, nervous, nervous character, and so like he's certainly not going to uh, volunteer for any like sort of heroic exploits. So like that only leaves Millicent Simmons, and she says, "Fuck it, we out here." And what's great too is the first one starts out by killing their youngest. Yeah, like the the creatures like murdering their their youngest child, and so we already know that this movie is okay with child death. Yes. Like, this movie is okay with, with doing that. So the stakes feel real. Because so often, like, in, in movies that have, like, child protagonists in them, you, you're you just sort of lulled into a state of comfort, like, even during, like, moments of tension, because it's like, cool, they're a kid. They're not, they're not going to murder most the kid. Fil- yeah, most films movie are not going to kill has. a child. Yeah. We started with that. So, like, no one is safe. Like, so the stakes are always high in these movies. Well, I love that. I mean, in this one, too, our first act includes the kid getting his foot in a bear trap. Stepping in the bear trap. Jesus Christ. Which is one of the most harrow, if not the most harrowing moments uh, in in the film. Yes. I audibly gasped uh, when that happened. Yeah, and it's honestly one of the most brutal sequences yeah. in the film. He's, you know dealing with that for the rest of the film it's one of the crux of the story in trying to make sure he can stay alive with that you know right Um, that's the whole reason emily blunt leaves later in the first place is she has to go get medication for him uh so he doesn't get infected but yeah man that shit that scene is fucking wild they already trigger one trap that like is calling in the creatures and they're running and he steps on a bear trap and uh just starts like shrieking when the we already know the creatures are coming and it's like this is so bad this is so bad and at that point like we haven't met Cillian Murphy yet all we see is like somebody watching them like through a scope of the scope of a rifle like presumably whoever set up these traps 
Mm. And I mean, I guess if you watch the trailer, you know it's Cillian Murphy, but... Uh, I didn't, which was cool. Like, Joe and I, I guess, like, I, I'm, I'm really impressed, Joe, that, like, you didn't see the, the trailer, like, much at all. Because I, I found myself fucking bombarded by it. And I, I again, before I'd seen the first one, um, because again, I only just watched it. So in the movies, you know, like we're watching something else and here comes the fucking trailer and surround sound. So every time I was having to like close my eyes, plug my ears and just hum because I did not want to like, you know, like have it spoiled for me before I'd seen the first one. So yeah, I, uh, I was like fortunate enough to not know that Cillian Murphy was in this one. Either. Yeah, Joe, how do you how do you pull that off when you to, to avoid mm-hmm film trailers like i don't go out of my way to watch trailers for most stuff but like i go to the movies enough that i always see so many trailers do you just like show up after the previews or do you just like not pay or like look down during the previews so i've been doing this probably since like 2012 not watching movie trailers so i've gotten progressively better at hiding from them so in regards to the movie theaters I bring headphones with me and I have like a playlist ready of loud songs. I just crank up the music and I just like look down at my phone. It's pretty intense in that like I also try to like show up late to the trailers. So like I'm catching like the last one or two trailers. If it's a Purge movie trailer or a Fast and Furious trailer, I do not give a shit. I'm watching that. Nice. Like (laughs) that's... Hell yeah. So you've the, seen the trailers for the Forever the Purge. Oh, or cool. if I am, I don't care. But uh, for other ways of avoiding it, uh, I just block and mute words like on Twitter and social like social media mm-hmm. so that those never pop up. In terms of trailers, to this film's credit, and whoever made the same trailer that we saw for this movie for months... A lot of trailers do a really bad job of, like, showing the whole movie in the fucking trailer. And this trailer did a really good job of keeping, like, all the action confined to stuff from the first act. Mm -hmm. Well, and the stuff they showed later in the movie, it feels almost like a red herring and kind of mis intentionally mm-hmm. misleading in that like when i saw the trailer i expected it to be like oh what if humans are the real enemies yes. and you know you get that Thank shot God, of that yeah seriously you get that shot of dijma hunsu and cillian murphy like putting the kids in the closet and you expect, oh, these are the real villains of the movie. Yes. And it wasn't that, I'm thank so, God. I'm so glad you brought that up because I was thinking the same thing because the trailer emphasizes that so hard with Cillian Murphy's line. Like, the kind of people that are left aren't those that are, aren't those worth saving. And I was so afraid that this whole fucking movie was going to do the Walking Dead thing where... Or Last like, of Us. Where, like, humans are the real monsters, and the mm. monsters are secondary. And it's like, I'm it's, not... It's the Cormac McCarthy thing. Yeah. I'm not I'm not totally against that. I mean, except no Cormac McCarthy books have, like, supernatural invaders or anything like that. It's sure. Dawn humans, of the Dead, but bad. Right, right, exactly. And it's like, that premise is fine, but it's been done to death, especially in the post-apocalypse. Like, of course, when society breaks down, people show their true colors. We know this. And for the for A Quiet Place, I don't give a shit about that. I want the monsters. This is a monster movie. I'm here for the monsters, right? So, like, the fact that the trailer implied that so heavily and it ended up not being the central narrative force of this film was its saving grace. There's, like, one scene where we have, like, uh, bad people. And I thought that scene was great. And I was very happy with how self-contained it was. And there wasn't, like, like a governor-style villain for this whole movie, you know? Yeah, and that that scene on the, the boat dock that you're talking about was really interesting because for these this villainous sort of gang they were really incompetent when you think about Uh, it the most incompetent and i want to circle back to that because i think it's good to set that sequence up a little bit we've talked about the train when uh Mm -hmm. she goes off uh on her own uh but we didn't didn't really mention that afterwards cillian murphy is sort of redeemed by going after her 
And, well, Emily uh, Blunt and, sends him after her, like, bring my daughter home. And when he finds her, she's like, look, don't take me back. Help me. You said that you don't feel like you did enough for your family who died. Now you can do something. Like, help me get to the island. Like, help me in my quest. Mm -hmm. And he, So it's an opportunity for his own redemption. Right. Which is really cool. And like, he takes it, it's nice and it's stuff. great. And I love that. Mm -hmm. And also because, like, they have, prior in the movie, like, had some tension. Because when they first show up, he's saying it's like, okay, you can stay the night, but tomorrow you all have to be gone. Like, there's not enough food, there's not enough supplies, I can't keep you safe, you can't stay here. And she kind of blows up on him and is like, you're nothing like my dad. Like, my dad is, like, a hero. You're not good, my dad! You're not my dad! Uh, really glad there wasn't an Emily Blunt, Cillian Murphy romance subplot. I didn't really expect one, but there's Dude, always there's, that, there's always that danger. There is gonna be a third movie i'm there's sure. always that please danger no please uh, don't do that the third hopefully movie. they're I'm, smart enough to not do that they aren't uh, i don't trust it i don't trust it i don't I, know Maybe. Yeah, they're, they're two really for bad. two yeah that's true. yeah they're, they're two for two so far i don't we'll have see. any i i have yet to be given reason to think that they'll uh that they'll fail me in that way yeah so like that that's really nice that like he's the one who has to go after her and also he like sort their their relationship changes you know like there's there's that tension between them at first but through the hardship they become closer you know and he does to an extent take on sort of a father like role well, for her. In, it's the same it's the same arc that like Joel and Ellie have in The Last of Us just <laughs> compressed, right? Like sure. Joel doesn't want the responsibility and also like his daughter had been mur like savagely murdered by like the the monsters, like just like Cillian yeah. Murphy's character. Um there is that same resentment almost, you know, towards, like, this young girl. It's like, well, you survived, but my, my baby but girl... But my kids it's, didn't. It's very, very similar narrative there. And, again, like, Joel, like, helps Ellie, like, largely through, like, his own personal, like, redem means of redemption as well. And by the end of it, Ellie essentially is a daughter to Joel. What I like is, like, this film doesn't necessarily end with that. It's still, like, a big brother, almost, you know, like, like, or uncle, you know, like. Well, he a, does, he does. He's, he's, he does at the end. The end. Yeah, he I does. I would say, like, he's a father figure. Like, he doesn't, like, step in to replace her father, which I like. No, which no, is no, a good no, thing. no, no, no. No, largely in this, but uh, he does. He does at the end, uh, like put himself directly in harm's way in order for her to succeed. And he doesn't die. Like she, you know, she get does her thing in time. But he's put into a situation where he's about to die. Yes. Uh, and and in that regard, I I kind of think that it's nice they didn't just repeat exactly what they did in the first one where John Krasinski sacrifices himself for the kids. It's like Cillian Murphy yeah. tries to sacrifice himself for her, but she saves him. Right, because, like, you know, like... Because she couldn't save her father. Not all good poetry rhymes, and someone should tell that to George <laughs> Lucas, but, like... Yeah, that's, it's like Poetry Man, it rhymes. Yeah, like, that's a... Uh, like, it, it, it's nice when you know, like they're like they're like it ripples out, but there there are changes there. Like, yeah, uh, and you no, know, it's well done. So anywho, he feels the need to help her, and so they go off on their way to find a boat, and they find some boats, as you were saying, Ben. So now we've, we've circled back around. Yeah, and I think that sequence is really well done. You know, interesting. He comes across a woman or a girl, a little girl. Yeah, a little girl. Sitting on the dock, seemingly crying. Mm -hmm. He goes to comfort her, and shit goes south very quickly. Well, we'll get into the specifics in a second, but when, what I want to note about that whole part of the movie is that it's like a triple sort of climax where it's cutting back and forth to like three extremely tense moments yeah in in like a way that i almost found overwhelming but like in the best way because it's like that it's like almost a 10 minute sequence where 
every single one of our characters is in immediate mortal danger in yes. very different ways. And they do it again at the end and it rules. And it's and it's fucking awesome cuz like yeah, they find the little girl, she turns out to be nasty and when he goes to comfort <laughs> her, she like puts a noose around his neck that is like tied to a fishing net that's covered in like cans so it jangles if he tries to get out of it. And then all of these, like, scurvy uh, swamp people come out of the boats and uh, and are, you know, nasty human people. But at the same time, a creature has found its way into the hideout where the little brother is left alone with the baby. He hi tries to hide in, like, the furnace, which they set up really well at the beginning with them hiding in, and when they go in, Silly Murphy sets his timer because he knows when the oxygen run when air runs out, and he has to open the door. Uh, and he has, like, a towel that, like, stops the thing from locking. But in his fear, in his haste to escape from the creature, the little brother neglects the towel, and the thing locks on him. So he and the baby are in there. They run out of air. The baby's oxygen tank is pretty much empty. They're asphyxiating. Cillian Murphy and Millicent Simmons are being attacked by uh, pirates. Um, and meanwhile, Emily Blunt is trying to get back to her son, but is dealing with the creature that's stalking around outside. Uh, and it's like just cutting back and forth between all of these things. I like... I I was like, whoa, this is fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah, it, it rules. It's it's uh it's almost as impactful as the space battle being intercut with uh Obi Wan and Qui Gon fighting uh, <laughs> Darth Maul uh while the Duel of Fates is playing in episode one of Phantom Menace. <laughs> but, 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 but. Like it, it's really it's really an Duel of the like, Fates is the only thing that this part in Quiet Place Two was missing. <laughs> oh wow, yeah. I would love to see that that intercut. But um uh sorry, I, I had to reference George Lucas again because I, I feel I was feeling silly, but uh, Joe, uh, how did how does that whole climax strike you? Because that was I that felt like one of the most powerful uh, or impactful moments of the movie to me. I'd love to know how that how that hit you. Yeah, I loved it. I was really happy that they had just like the right amount of nasty humans in there. If it was like overwhelming, you know, like you said, like they go the Walking Dead route, and then they have like this huge like presence of human antagonists in it i would have been it would have been a huge buzzkill but it's so like you said it's super just self-contained in the most perfect way and i think it's really cool how they like that's not the first time that little girl put a noose around a human's neck which is a really kind of messed up thing mm, yeah. about it like this is planned she's the bait and people fall for it constantly enough where she was able to just whip around and yeah she acts with such yeah, efficiency just... <laughs> unlike how i just said that there she acts with such efficiency yeah, yeah definitely. very smooth in her in her movements and i i think part of part of that thing is it, that scene is saved by the the nature of the threat in the film that like you're forced to be quiet like so often in these movies were spared like exposition like meaningless exposition and stuff because the characters can't speak. And I think we were spared a villainous monologue in that scene because the characters can't well, speak. What's cool is we still get one. The pirate, the, the quiet, yeah. uh, uh, king or whatever, like the, the, the guy who has the most scurvy of all of them. So is obviously the leader. Uh, should, um, he starts like taking items off of, uh, Millicent, the way that he, he's looking at Cillian Murphy and the con, like the, the, the wordless conversation that they have between each other feels like a villain monologue. Like, that would be the moment where the right, villain would be walking around. And but it's it, not corny. No, no, it's, yeah, no, absolutely. Because it's, it, it's, because it's organic. Real, yeah, yeah, it's organic. Um, and, and I agree. But what I'll say about this scene, good things, or actually, do you have more? If you're gonna, no, 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 go yeah. ahead. I know where, where you're going, and yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's time. It's time we get there. Uh, what I will say about this scene is I think also almost all of the massive plot holes that I see in this film are, uh, uh, confined to that confined scene. Confined to this sequence. Yep. And like, mm -hmm. if we, if, if changes had been made or the scene had been cut, 
I wouldn't want to cut it because like I do love how it is no, intercut with the other. It's like, really well sequences. done. It's really yeah. well done. And, but yeah, everything yeah. there is amazingly done. It's just like the implications behind all of it, like just leave these massive holes in the massive holes in the plot. Hard to look away from when you see him. But again, it's it looks great. Uh, let, let's let's dig into that. I think we do kind of have to describe the rest of the scene though for for the holes to be made clear. Uh, so Cillian Murphy does something really neat. Um, which is he signs Dive to Millicent. And I love that because that's the that's the one piece of sign language he learns at the very, very beginning of the film before, you know, on day one, um, when they're at the baseball game because he's trying to tell him to dive. Tell like, the kid to dive, dive for home. Home, yeah, for yeah. home base. And so he asks her, like, what is the sign for dive? Yeah. Yeah, no, I thought that was a really awesome callback. Mm -hmm. I loved that. Yeah, that's, that's how you do one of those. Like, that's how you have, like, a... a foreshadowing that feels organic mm -hmm. um because in in the moment like at the beginning of the movie it feels like something someone would do i buy it and i buy it there and it's super useful to the plot and in a way that again feels organic they need to get the boats they're not he they don't i don't feel like these characters are there just so that they can say dive you know like it it all it all lines up it, yeah. it's clever as fuck frankly yeah that rules so she does Silly Murphy gets the, the jangly bits around the, the scurvy man, um, and he dives in the water as that well. That didn't sound right. Well, he, he stabs <laughs> him, he takes a knife and he stabs him in the leg, so he screams. Yeah! Because the creatures show up, and, you know, when she jumps in, and so all the other people start running, and he, like, lashes the dude to a pole and stabs him in the leg, so he screams, and then jumps right when the creature, like, slashes him. Yeah, that part is great. It's so satisfying. That scene yeah. is incredibly satisfying. It delivers something that, like, the first one, it's not a problem, but it doesn't happen in the first one, something like that, where you kind of get this release there's so many like good climax release points in this film, which makes it so entertaining and so fun. Yeah, yeah. Nice. The first I... one, the first one is largely devoid of triumph until the end, mm -hmm. and this movie, yeah. this one has several instances of triumph, and that's a really good one. Also, I love that they set up that scene with, like, the bad people and then end it just as quickly instead of us having to get a whole thing where they're, like, holding them captive or whatever and they're going to eat them yeah, or something and, like, up. they have to figure out a way to escape. It's like they get captured and then in the same scene they escape because the monsters show up because, once again, it's about those monsters, baby. Mm -hmm. um, but I will address the first of the, the two major plot holes yes. in this scene <laughs> is that they go to this dock because the island where they can see the radio tower broadcasting is, like, right there. But all of these people, these scurvy people, are just hanging out on these boats and apparently not trying to get to the island. Oh, so we're doing that one first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that, that was that was my bet. Is like there's a colony of of boat of boatmen, like of boat people. Yeah, they're literally living on boats right next to this island, but they they well, never find it because they're like they're pirates. Like they're obviously like not out for like the good of their fellow man. Like they would have raided that place. Also, like, like yeah. wouldn't it make sense to keep their colony like moored offshore? Right. Like, wouldn't it that be was a, safer? Like, yeah, only going inland, like when absolutely when, when necessary. you have to. Yeah, and it's like okay, maybe we could argue that they went inland to like hunt for people, like to to try to trap them. Maybe maybe they usually do take the boats out or They're whatever. They're trying to get some long but pork. The, but the fact the fact that they never even considered like, hey, we might be safer if we go to that island that's like literally right there. Yeah. Like the fact that they never consider especially when Cillian Murphy and Millicent Simmons get to the island right after this scene and just discover that like a whole colony of people have just been living there. It's chilling. It just chilling this whole time. Like the the fact that the that the pirates never once were caused a problem for those people also you could sw a, a strong swimmer another... could swim to that fucking island and let's talk about that let's talk about yeah. that last part <laughs> which which, which ropes us back into the next part is these creatures have very long limbs 
they are very powerful. Now, I guess they have very strong hides, but, like, we do see them, like, go into the water, like, struggle and struggle to get out, but they get out, right? Like, some of these creatures. And now, in the first movie, we see them interact with water, but it is, like, in shallow water. Uh, in the first movie, well, yeah, like, that's... when the basement is flooded, like, we see it go down into the basement, and, like, the way it goes under the water, it looks like it's an aquatic creature. Yes. Like, it looks like it is yes. It is designed, like, because, like, it goes down into the water, which is only, like, four feet deep, and it's yeah. a big creature, and it just disappears. Right. Like, in this basement. And, uh... Like, you can, you can make the argument that because it's shallow water, it's just crawling around on the yeah, bottom. and it's comfortable and it's not, in it, yeah. And it's not swimming. But, yeah, it, the, the way the film, the first film, presents that is that, oh, yeah, these horrible creatures that are, like, super OP in every other way, Apex they Predators. also, they also swim. And then this movie says, you know what? Actually, fuck that. Nope. <laughs> because one of them tries to jump off of a boat at Cillian Murphy and just drowns yeah. immediately. Looks like a big fool. And it's like, pick one. Either one is fine, well, but you can't have both. It's like, the same problem I have in the first film. Do they echolocate or do they not? These creatures, can they swim or can they not? It's like, <laughs> I, I'm comfortable with them not being able to swim. They have, like, stony hides. They're probably very heavy. I'm not, for reasons we'll get into in a second. Like, I, I'm fine with them not being able to swim, but... If the first one shows one of them seemingly swimming, then don't turn that into their fucking weakness in the well, second movie. Here's the problem, though, right? Contained within itself, like, that's where the plot holes stop. Like, the people didn't find the island. But we also have to look at this as, like, this is a greater apocalypse where, like, the military didn't show up. And are you saying that islands are these creatures weaknesses because there are a lot of islands on earth dog the military like didn't just set up on alcatraz and like like fucking hang out how I'm how willing, is this how did I'm this apocalypse to, happen i'm willing to set that aside because i'm not we don't know that there isn't like a military encampment on alcatraz or whatever we because it is the apocalypse communication and supply lines have been severed so we don't know how many pockets of people living on islands around the world there are. Hawaii, probably fine. As <laughs> long as, like, probably very little has changed on Hawaii. Unless, uh, un unless like, a meteor fell explicitly on Hawaii. The point is, is, like, it has severed all of these, like, small groups of people from each other so they can't interact. That's standard apocalypse shit. I'm fine with that. I, like, my frustration is that the goddamn creatures are shown swimming in the first one, and then in the second one they say they can't swim. That's their weakness. See, for me, I, I also don't have a big problem with kind of intentionally limiting the scope of our knowledge yeah. of what's going on. My problem is mm -hmm. the way they decide to get the creature to the island anyways it just drifted over on a boat yeah i buy that though i think that's fine i buy that <laughs> yeah they can't swim so uh yeah this uh this boat just uh floated over there well, they, why actually, not like here's the thing right the like, boat like, was right currents. there yeah like yeah. like the the boat colony is like right down the way and like we actually we saw that creature on the boat like it was the same one like that boat is the one from the colony like that was from those events occurring like that creature yeah, got stranded yeah. on that boat because it's coming after them and it's coming in this it's going in the same direction so that like we actually see all the events that would set that up occur which is cool like like that actually that actually was like was yeah but yeah, at the same time it was so intentionally written that way because they couldn't just swim over well of course like, we like, have uh, to well, we, yeah, like, that I get. Yeah, the, yeah, I, right. the island can't be an entirely safe place for them for the rest of the movie yeah it defeats the purpose obviously we have to get a creature at least one creature to the island yeah somehow. if you're gonna make the people on the island good that aren't fucked up yeah. you gotta send a creature to the island right. to fuck them up well for the movie you right. know Trouble well so here's my question <laughs> do you have a better way to get one of the creatures to the island if they can't swim no like, just would... have them swim <laughs> just make it so they can swim yeah i mean it's like, just I like said... the island see what well, here's what's cool right 
the island wor- could still work if the creatures could swim. Yeah, because, because they're the far enough out of away. Shot from yeah, the yeah, line. exactly. So like, like it could still. I work. don't know. It's implied that they can hear shit miles away, and the island is no more than a mile. Yeah, but at the same shore. time, in the first one, they're like talking next to a waterfall. Like, and that's enough to yep. shield. Well, because there's more noise or whatever. 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 I, I agree. <laughs> like, it's the inconsistency that bothers me. I'm fine with you not making them swim. Just be fucking consistent about it. Joe, did did this drive you as crazy as it drove us? Not at all, actually. Really? None okay. None of these things bothered me. In regards to the first one, I don't mind. The water's pretty shallow, and those are actually really tall creatures. And I like to think that they're hearing underwater better because they're looking for their prey. So they go underwater. Sound does. I don't really know how they hear. So they're hearing underwater. And then in regards to the whole island thing and that those pirate type people, I don't think they have a strong knowledge of how these creatures, where they are at, if they can swim. Maybe they did figure that out. But I just kind of release myself of that. I don't know if I would want to take my boat across to an island. Maybe it's infested with creatures and not with humans. And I'm about to get my comeuppance. Like, I don't, I don't know if that's how. So I just pretty much release myself of that and just kind of enjoy what I'm seeing. There's like very few instances that I actually get upset about plot holes. Partially because like, as much as I enjoy these two films, my expectations, I think my expectations are actually going to be pretty high for the third one, but they're pretty low. Like, mm-hmm. I it was just kind of like, I'm just going to have a good damn time with this. Mm-hmm. And I think that's you're- what they deliver. I think you're right in that regard. And I think that, like we mentioned, like the the saving grace of this movie is that it is so entertaining and the tense scenes are so well done that you can overlook these plot holes. I think they definitely still exist, but Mm -hmm. in a less entertaining film, I would find them much more egregious. I would have much harder time overlooking them. Because you're absolutely right, Joe. Like, these are the type of movies that I'm just going in to watch, like, a fun, spooky monster movie. Well, I think we said it at the beginning of the podcast, too, like, that none of these things got in the way, like, uh, of that. I, I, I definitely said it, like, walking out of the movie theater as yeah. well. Like, uh, they, like they did not... They were very, like, visible for me, but they didn't in any way detract from my enjoyment. They gave me it's pause. Like, they, they broke my immersion to the extent that I recognized them and was like, hey, wait a second. Yeah, hold on. So in that, in that regard, like, they took me out of the film, but not for long enough that I was just, like, thinking about it nonstop. Mm-hmm. Like, once we got past that scene, and it's like they got the creature onto the island because it drifted over on the boat, it's like, I was just back in, yeah. you know? Like, yeah. I was... Which, I was, is, which is a real testament to the film, because, like, we're pretty invested in world building. You know, yes. like, like our game is, like, has a lot of heavy and rich world building in it. And uh, it's, we, we tend to be drawn to, to narratives that are ornately detailed in that respect. And, right. uh, like, I, I certainly love it. And, uh, and to, to encounter, like, things that break that to such a degree and not be that bothered by it is a it, testament to the movie. Yeah, like, it's because a, all the other things are done so well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, I mean, the the boat drifting over, I think, for me, the frustration is mostly out of personal preference, just because I think structurally and pacing-wise, it makes so much sense to have the creature come over and mm-hmm. cause havoc, because... This movie is incredibly consistent in that, like, every 10 or 15 minutes, there's a really, really tense set-piece sort of scene. Yep. Mm-hmm. I was just mad because Digimon Huntsu is one of my yes. favorite character actors. Yeah, dude. And he is r- kind of underutilized in this movie, to Bro, be honest. You know, you know who he was replacing, who they who originally cast in this role but had to drop because of scheduling conflicts? is uh fucking Brian Tyree Henry Paperboy. 
Okay, I could see him doing well. Man, I, I think Nishiman Hansu killed it. I thought, no, I thought he did great. I, I think he probably did a better I mean, job than he's, he's, he was Henry on there. Would have. He's, a, he's a great, he's a great character actor. I agree with you 100%. But, like, it was, like, they were already shooting. They were already in production when they, when they replaced uh, Brian Tyree Henry with him. So I just thought that was interesting. I agree with you, though. He gets killed off a little too quickly yeah. for my taste. I think it he would have been a fun character to add to the the group that will obviously be going into Quiet Place Part 3. I thought he would have been a fun addition. I want to go on he, a... He died in kind of a stupid way, too, yeah, if I'm yeah. being real. Yeah. Oh, we we beat the monster. He's like, oh, he's like, yeah, they're trying to lure the, the creature away from the town while they're going to the radio station. He's like, what if we drove too fast? What if it went, it went back to the town? My family He's back there, and then it just comes out well, from under the garage actually, door and fucks him up. I'm gonna bat. I'm gonna bat for his character's perspective there. I, I'm also bummed out that he died that quickly, but I I do see the logic in that because here's the thing, right? Like, I don't think it was that we outdrove them. I can't remember exactly how he framed it, so I could I could be very well. Yeah, he wrong. said we went too fast. We drove too fast. Yeah, and we yeah. lost it, and it went back to the it went back to town. Yeah, because like what I would buy, like what I would what I would think in that scenario is it's so incredibly fast. We couldn't have outpaced it. It must have turned around, right? That's we not be how dead it's framed, right now. Yeah. Like, yeah, and like that—that that would make sense. But, but he, like, he's a good—he's yeah. a good person. Like, he cares about his family, of course. And he's worried about that. And in the moment, like, you know, like there's no time to think. Like, sometimes there isn't time to think logically. For character motivation, it makes sense. I'm talking more from like a script perspective. Sure, sure, sure. Where like, yeah, okay, it makes sense for his character to have that concern and to die that way because he's worried about his family. But for the movie to introduce him, have him for such a short time, and then have him die in kind of a dumb way is like eh. yeah I, and I, with I think that. conceptually some of that stuff is a little underdeveloped uh which again like pacing wise it makes sense and i think it's the best thing this kind of movie can do but like i would have been fascinated learning more about how this island in isolation what yeah. sort of governance they have how it continues to function i agree but you know it is what it is i think ultimately it goes to interesting places i just it's wanted fine. more think... from him on a tangent i remember years ago they were trying to make a god of war movie and i was thinking man jishman hansu would have been a great kratos he would be a great Whoa. kratos yeah, you're yeah, so I right see it. i definitely see yeah. it yeah god damn uh, yeah, but that's just a tangent. I I think he's a great actor. And I think so too. Want to see him in more things. And I I just think oh, like ultimately my frustration lies in the fact that his character did not have to die there. His character didn't die for a reason that furthered the narrative other than to remove him from it. The rest of the film could have played out the exact same way with him there. And then we would have just had him along for the ride for the next movie, you know? It felt like it felt like a, a needless death. It's like they they needed somebody to die so they introduced a character just to kill them it, it's a shame too like you think that he he, he would have like heard the creature you know like i mean dijon mustard heard the creature god damn it god damn it Jeez. fuck get him off fuck i never want to hear this voice on that podcast <laughs> again <laughs> I fucking restrained yeah. from making Digimon jokes, and you fucking. I'm out here. Oh. oh. <laughs> Yikes. See, it's like mustard. It's like Dijon mustard. It but runs. it's must heard. Yeah, yeah. I got it. I yeah. got it. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> so, Digimon. No, I'm. Digimon I thought about soup. a little too much <laughs> that I don't really know if I should have even, like, thought more about it. Was there a motivation for Noah Jupe to explore when he was left alone and when yeah. he comes across Emmett's dead wife? Kids explore. That's about all I got. Yeah, like, getting cagey. The only thing that I, I can think of is that, like, mom's been gone for a while. Like, I'm going to go out and look around. But n no, no solid motivation. It was... it. 
once again, like that's that's one of those things where like he had to go out and find uh, Cillian Murphy's wife's corpse so he could become startled and uh, trip and fall over and make a loud noise to call the creature there. That's all that was. And that's yeah, because I felt like there was some moment in the basement that like he was looking for something. And then he goes straight up top. And I couldn't tell if I was, like, supposed to pick up on something. I don't think so. Um, okay. I don't think so. I cool, didn't cool. get that impression, at least. It was just kind of like he'd been left alone for hours. He was getting cagey. Nobody's come back yet, so I'm going to go look around. I think that's that's all it really was. I liked Emily Blunt's sequence where she shoots the oxygen canister to set off the the, the fire alarm. Yeah. Well, it's cool because, like, she places it in, like, a pool of oil and waits till the creature's right next to it. So you think that, like, she's going to blow up the creature. Which but is dumb because, like, we know that, like, the creature can't like be blown up that way, which it's, is cool. Yeah, it's too heavily armored and it just, like, walks right out of that explosion. But for then the fire to set off the sprinklers so it makes noise to distract it is, it was really nice. Yeah, I, super I agree. Clever. I liked that. Something well, else. With Go the ahead. oxygen canister that I thought w- was super dark, but like very tense and thrilling, was when Noah Juke takes the oxygen away from the baby to get some oxygen for himself. I know that's totally reasonable, and I would be doing the same, but I was like, just floored, like, God yeah. damn. Like, the baby's just like, <laughs> and he's like, nah, let me get some of that. <laughs> That scene was so tense, <laughs> too, because, so like, leading up to it, we, we see that the tank is almost out of oxygen, too. Like, it's already in the red. So, like, at that point, like, there's a creature outside. They're locked inside this furnace and can't get out. Like, he's panicking. There's no oxygen. There's barely any in the tank. Like, that... Yeah, and to intercut that with the stuff at the dock and then Emily Blunt shooting the oxygen tank up above, like, it's just so much like, really great, tense stuff happening all at once. Definitely the highlight of the movie for me. I think Noah Juke, like, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm still riding, like, the high from watching that, but his performance was, like, best supporting actor worthy for me. Oh, his, interesting. His coming out of, like, the furnace and, like, tears are just, like, dripping. Like, I know it's, like, raining, but, like, there's tears actually coming from his face. He's trembling, He's facing his fear. His mom nearly got ripped to shreds. I don't know why, but I just started weeping when I saw that scene. It, like, it was like one of the strangest reactions. Like, everyone else seemed to be like, oh, shit, you know, like, kids about to, like, blow this monster away. But it just, like, felt so emotional. I, like, felt like a parent in that scene. It's very well earned, for sure, because Mm -hmm. he spends so much of the movie, like, being so timid and afraid, and to have him take the gun and and shoot the creature in the face at the end and sort of, like, reclaim his courage and his agency uh, feels good. I mean, and of course he does it through the help of his sister, because at that point... She, you know, they've they've gotten into the the radio station, and she puts her her hearing aid against the mic. So he's been listening on the boombox, like waiting to hear that, and then unplugs it so he can use the radio as a weapon. It's a really nice proof of concept for like w- the whole purpose of what she's trying to do is like taking the sort of singular weapon that they have and like multiplying it. I did think that it was. I'll say interesting, I'm not super critical of it, but interesting that they ended this film in the exact same way they ended the first one, with them making a feedback loop from the hearing aid, the creature getting stunned, and then shooting it in the face. And, well... Noah Jupe shot one creature in the face and Millicent Simmons bashed another one in yeah, the face. Yeah, because it's Quiet Place 2. Because it's two, yeah. So they so they did the exact same thing, but two <laughs> times. Yeah. So uh, three no, creatures no, the will die. Like, in the, the same level one. as the sister, you know? Yeah. Like, he's, he's achieved his He courage. has his moment of triumph, too, but, and like... Value, yeah. and then And then to go from, to, like, go from that moment cut to black like it's the, it's literally the exact same way that the first one ends. And it's like, 
I'm sure that was intentional, but I don't know how I feel about it. It almost feels a little bit too sane. Yeah. Like it's it's triumphant and victorious and like I like it, but at the same time I was like when when the credits rolled, I was like, oh, so exactly like the first one then, huh? It almost felt abrupt to me just because I didn't expect them to do the exact same thing. I right. expected them to do that and then continue it with yeah, something like maybe else. like maybe have like sort of a denouement with like uh you know Cillian Murphy and Millicent Simmons going back for Emily Blunt and then like hey we we found a safe place like come to the island or whatever but I guess they're saving all of that for part three which has been confirmed is happening yeah um, uh to talk about that quickly I saw that the third one is being written and directed by uh, Jeff Nichols, who did uh, Take Shelter, um, which, if you guys haven't seen that movie, it's absolutely worth checking out. Michael Shannon sees visions of an apocalyptic storm and tries to protect his family. It's kind of horror-adjacent. But it's one of the best films of the last decade, and I'm super excited to see where wow. he takes this uh, franchise. Big praise. Yeah. Nice. Oh, that's interesting. Are you guys ready to rate? Yeah. Uh, I'll start. Yeah, I liked this movie a lot. The couple of big glaring plot holes uh, managed to still not ruin the experience for me. Uh, really good performances across the board. Big fan of more Cillian Murphy, less John Krasinski. Liked that a lot. All the characters are great. Uh, big ups. Uh, performance of the film for me was Millicent Simmons, probably. But yeah, a lot of really great moments. Uh, it's going to be a strong four out of five for me. Yeah, ditto that. I think uh, this movie ratchets up a lot of the the tension that made the first one so good. And you get a lot more cathartic, triumphant moments mm. in this one, which is uh, a lot more rewarding and fun and i think they just kind of progressed the first one to a solid continuation and i feel like this is a great example of not falling into sequel syndrome because Mm -hmm. uh there is still very much narrative tension throughout the film and you feel like characters are actually in jeopardy it's not just another one yeah and you know Thanks, especially College. knowing that a third one was coming it didn't feel just like a a segue from the first to the third like uh, second movies often can yeah. so that's a really strong point of this one yeah i would give it a strong four out of five as well i really enjoyed it little to add ditto that strong four out of five joe bring us home movie theater experience i'm gonna cheat on this one was a five out of five. I mean, I just had a gosh dang hootin' tootin' rootin' good time. <laughs> Hell yeah. As far as I'm with you guys, I think it's a four out of five. I'm riding that, like, movie theater high back in, you know, uh, again. Yeah, I don't think I have anything else to add. Good-ass movie. Hell yeah. Well, that's a unanimous four out of five uh, for Quiet Place Part 2. Uh, definitely check it out. In uh, You brought up the theater experience. Uh, the three of us were uh, fortunate enough to catch it in our local uh, Dolby Theater, which was uh, really dope. Um, it looked great and sounded awesome, like a sound-based film in a theater specifically designed for like a really immersive, dynamic uh, auditory experience mm-hmm. was rad, uh, especially when I think back to when we saw the first one in theaters in Milwaukee and Black Panther was playing next door. I don't know <laughs> if you remember that, Joe. Uh, I do. How fucking all of the quiet moments were interrupted by uh, explosions and Marvel music. From... <laughs> and Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> and Ke- oh, and fu- yeah, and Kendrick Lamar. God, yeah, you're right. Uh <laughs> Uh, man, that was wild. Um, all right, yeah, so I think this is a, a hearty recommendation from all four of us. Uh, if you have a chance to still catch it in the theater, um, definitely do so, especially if you can get the Dolby experience. And if not, just hopefully there's not a loud movie next door. Um, now we have some predictions to take care of. Indeed. Uh, so I think we covered up to this one, so I think we're caught up. So it's just this one. Nice. 
Okay, so we'll start with Rotten Tomatoes. So, Tease, you predicted this would get an 85 on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, Cleveland, you predicted a 92. And I predicted an 83. Really? I, it's just um, like I had seen the, the previous one, and I had the highest Yeah, you were just uh, guessing. Yeah. yeah, I was just talking. Well, it was a 91. Hey! Oh, shit! Hey! Wow, okay. Oh. Pretty pretty close to being on the money Out there. Out from the mouth of babes. Uh, oh, really? So, our collective... Uh, rating prediction: TC predicted a three point seven, Cleve you predicted a three point five, and I predicted a two point five. Yes, <laughs> nice. Hell yeah! It's, so uh, I was right, pretty close. Yeah, right now we're tied. Uh, no, no, I think no. I'm still ahead. Tease ah. is up by one. T says five. That's right. Cleve has four, and I have one. Gun for unfortunately. You. Gunning for you. Well, um, uh, I think we will. Our our film next week is another one we predicted. Right? Indeed, uh, it is. We're uh, going to the opposite end of the spectrum, and we're going to break Cleveland next week because uh, we're uh, we're. We? You know this. You you know we've talked about this. Next week is uh, is Conjuring oh, Three. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't want to see it. I, I mean, don't none of us care. none of us want to see I don't it. Care none of us want to see it. <laughs> but we're a horror podcast, and we're. Right, well, I'm we, not watching the others. You don't have to. You don't have to. You don't have to. We're Go not because I, I also <laughs> don't want to rewatch those. It's not like you'll be lost. No. Good. Um, so yeah, next week uh, I'm hoping will be as entertaining as our episode on the <laughs> nun because I fully expect it to create uh, similar frustrations. Uh, so tune yeah. back next week for our review of The Conjuring Three: The Devil Made Me Do It. The Devil's making us watch it, uh, and in this case, the devil is me. <laughs> <laughs> you bastard. Uh, Cleveland, it's time for you to, uh, I hear the jingle and jangle. It's time for you to pull from the sponsor shelf and let us know who, uh, who we're sponsored by this week. A new mouth has opened and from that new mouth, a new tongue has rolled down presenting a new piece of paper. And on that paper, it reads, our sponsor this week is, oh, speaking of mouths, a train with a mouth and he's not afraid to use it. <laughs> um, God damn! So th- it, wait, is this? Uh, hold on, Te- your your eyes are better than mine. And there's there's a uh, there's some fine print here uh, explaining the 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 utility, uh, the the value of a train with a mouth that's not afraid to use it. And I I can't read it. I just I can't tell what it. Does it? Does that? What does it say there? That it's a product for what? What is the? Is it? Is it transportation? Is it? What is it? What is a train with a mouth that's not afraid to use? What is it using the mouth for that it's not afraid of? Have you ever seen Thomas the Tank Engine? I, I have. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh. I, I say no more. That mouth is for mouthing off. Oh. Lick emotion. Lick. Oh. <laughs> like locomotion. Oh. What what that mouth do, oh. train? Yeah, damn. <laughs> Uh, yeah, actually, this uh, uh, scratch that. This uh, this episode is brought to you by my new funk album, Lick Emotion. <laughs> uh, yeah, get ready to hear my white ass do funk music in Lick Emotion. Um, God damn. Choo choo. <laughs> choo choo. Oh yeah. And this mouth, it's not afraid to chew. Chew. Matisse. Yeah. I will only do this podcast with you from now on. <laughs> ben and Cleveland are just dropping too many, too many bad jokes. All right, so no, yeah, next time it'll just be me and Joe. Hey, you <laughs> can cover Conjuring Three. Ben and Cleveland spare Cleveland. Yeah, I. that sounds great. Yeah, no. you know what? Yeah, hey, no, no, you already said it. You already, it's too late. It's official. It's, that's how it works around here. Uh, All right. We're sorry, guys. We're not, I'm not going to a... be on there for the Conjuring episode. Oh, what a. Oh. Oh, what a shame. Oh, man. Damn. Damn. Oh, I guess this is a me and Joe Shea podcast <laughs> from now on. I'm okay with that. Uh, <laughs> I'm okay with this.
All right. Well, that'll bring us to the end of this week's episode. Oh, if you, you like, a loophole, ben. <laughs> if you like the show, uh, be sure to leave us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts and uh, a couple words as a, a nice review. We r- really appreciate that. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Pod People Pod and at Letterbox.com slash Pod People Pod, where you'll find a list of all the films we've talked about on the show with our average ratings and links to those reviews. Also, if you want to support the boys in a different way, we have a Patreon now. Uh, you can find that at patreon.com slash podpeoplepod. Uh, we've got three different uh, sponsor tiers that uh, you can be a part of. Shout out to our honorary pod boy tier, which uh, now consists of Sam Simon. And that is what you get as part of the honorary pod boy tier is you get a shout out on the show. So shout out to Sam for putting some money in our pocket. Thank you, Sam. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at some spooky snake. I'm on Twitter at Mr. Sheets. And I'm occasionally... I'm not occasionaling. I'm occasionally <laughs> tweeting. <laughs> there we go. I'm occasionally tweeting for Light Arc Studio as we put out content on It Stares Back. As a matter of fact, I tweeted today, and uh, I tweeted a beautiful land. Well, I mean, I'll let you decide if it's beautiful, but I tweeted a landscape today that I painted for the game. Uh, there's always uh, cool art that I'm tweeting um, for, for Light Arc Studio, uh, for, for our cool, spooky, dystopian, neo-noir, cybernetic fantasy spooky game that we, we we what we've made yeah whatever um, yeah it's on steam uh you can play it in early access right now and uh i'm also doing work for dread central um or sorry not well not dread central dread xp but you get it um anyway uh uh check out the the dread x collection the hunt um it's a pretty rad game that i worked on and um you can find my work on art station if you search cleveland Mosier and look at some cool arts that's all from me Joe? And you can follow me and support me on my OnlyFans at Big Booty Sad Art Boy. Nice. <laughs> nice. Dude, dude, hold on. Now we need to see if that actually is an OnlyFans. Of course. You know, is. we'll just, just let the people who are listening to the pod just find that out on their own. Let them take their own little Google search. <laughs> You've been working on some film projects, right? Is there anything that folks should be uh, on the lookout for? Pompano Boy coming to film festivals and some private Midwest screenings fall 2021. Pompano Boy. You heard it here. Pompano Boy. Awesome. Well, Joe, thank you as always for being on the show. It was a pleasure uh, once again, and we'll definitely have you back uh, sometime soon, hopefully. Sounds good. I love it. All right. Thanks, man. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening, and uh, I think it's time that we shut the fuck up. I could fly like birds on high, then straight to her arms.